<laughs> Romans 11, 33 through 34 tells us that God is infinite. His ways are past finding out. Uh, when He delivered us His inspired text, it should not be any surprise to us that it also has depth that we just keep unpacking and unpacking. In fact, as I was working on this lesson, I thought, well, I could do this and I do that and I do this and then we'd end up being here till midnight and you wouldn't like that. Well, I'd actually be preaching to an empty audience by then, I'm sure. And I thought, okay, I got to pick the parts that are going to fit here. So I want to give you this quick example of how you can unpack the Old Testament. In Matthew 22, 23, beginning, the Sadducees come to Jesus with their scenario about the woman who'd been married to the seven brothers under the Levite law, and then none of them had children. Time to get to heaven, whose wife will she be? And then Christ says, you don't know the book, do you? And he takes them back to the burning bush, and Moses talking to God, or God talking to Moses is at the bush. And he says, I am the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. And from that Old Testament incident, he unpacks all of that that says, basically, the Sadducees, y'all missed the whole point of it. Now, the thing is, none of us would have ever read that Old Testament account of Moses at the burning bush and walked away with the point Jesus made. Oh, yeah, that proves the dead are still alive in a spiritual form. But that's exactly the use Jesus made of it. Again, you go to Matthew 22, 23. So that, that's the kind of thing we're dealing with here when we start trying to unpack these things and the, the stuff that's in them. So we have manna, uh, and manna is going to be some historical stuff we're just going to look at. I mean, it's just straight up history. And then we're going to look at what Israel was supposed to be learning. And then finally, we're going to do a spiritual application for us. Now, this is where we're going to fall short. Because every time I reviewed and it was put polishing the lesson, as we like to call it, I saw more and more. And I said, there's no way we're going to get it all in. We might have to do a Wednesday night class for about six weeks on this sometime and, and just see what all we can get there. Because there's a, there is a lot there. So here's our, let's start the historical part. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Oh, bless their hearts. You hear all the whining? Tell me, where's their focus? And everybody's point to the belly. Their focus was all about the belly. They, they kind of miss it. Moses and Aaron, they're leaders over some of the most ungrateful people we will ever read about in the Bible. But parents get it, don't you? How grateful are your children? Now, as they grow up, they get more grateful, right? <laughs> when they're young, it's like, oh, they expect you to do everything exactly the way they want it. Doesn't work that way, does it? So God knows exactly what he's doing with this manna. He knows exactly why he's doing it. So we're going to drop down. And Exodus 16 is your main chapter. There are some other references. But if I remember right, there's only a mention of manna. 15 times in the entire Bible. So if you want to Google that on whatever you use, uh, you can find all the references pretty easy. But Exodus 16, which we're just picking out parts, that's uh, your main chapter. So the, so they're whining, they're bemoaning, they're like, oh, we remember how great Egypt was. Isn't that an irony right there? A little side point. Do not trust your memory. Your memory will lie to you like a dog. What, did, what were they doing back in Egypt when Moses showed up? They were moaning and crying and complaining to God. You've got to get us out of here. Now they're out. And what are they doing? Egypt was awesome. Why did we ever leave there? So the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, they prepare for when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So what we have is just some really simple instruction here. This is not rocket science. Look, this is Sunday through Thursday. You gather enough for a day, right? And on Friday, you gather enough for two days. That's it. How simple can you get you know the memes that go around sometimes on Facebook and it says you had one job and then it would show something that somebody really messed up. They had one job to do. Go out and get what they needed for that day and bring it home and eat it. And on Friday get enough for two days because they're going to rest on the Sabbath, right? So now God is going to feed these people and he feeds like a million people. Now we don't know exactly the number, but that's usually the general round estimate. And he does it every single day for 40 years. Now, I thought, okay, how do I get you to understand how many people a million people is? I can't do it. But I can give you a quick one. 
the entire population of the state of Arkansas was roughly 3,102 people. Okay. So now it's a third of the state of Arkansas. Now, if you want to take that third on the bottom, out the middle, left side, I don't care how you do it, but think about a third of the state of Arkansas is what he fed every day for 40 years, and 40 years times 365 is what? Say 14,600. Do the math in your head real quick. I didn't. Uh, and so this is what he does every single day. This is the God we serve. This is what he can do. And then I'm going to jump to the end for just a moment. Then they get to the promised land and the manna stops. So he says, the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. And so that takes you all the way to the end where we, we know it stopped. Now let's go back a little bit. So the Lord provides the manna. He's, he's taking care of his people, and God will always take care of his people. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. And when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. So this is manna. And if you want the definition for manna, it just means, What is it? Isn't that kind of funny? They took that word, and they used it, that became the name for manna. Now here's one of the little geeky things I want you to catch. Before this day, manna was a regular daily word. And before this day, when somebody saw something and they didn't know what it was, they would look at it and go, manna. And then somebody else would answer the question and try to tell them. Or they wouldn't know and they'd go, mm, manna. Mm -hmm. uh, and all they were saying before this day, manna was just a phrase that meant, what is it? After this day and this generation and this time, now all the way up to our time, almost 3,000 years later, every time we use the word manna, what do we think of? bread from heaven language does that and you need to keep that in mind because all our biblical words with rare exception if there even is an exception was just a regular daily word that people used all the time until we christianized it and made it our word for a specific thing so that, that's all you got now the one other thing if you go google this you'll come across some crazy stuff and they'll go oh yeah there's man in the desert all the time blah 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 yada 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 and and there's just some weird stuff on google I disagree with it because I don't think manna was natural. Because when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? Had manna been a regular occurrence on a smaller scale in the desert, then they would have looked at it and go, oh yeah, that's manna. I remember grandpa telling me about manna. Or I remember, you know, Father Abraham said they used to eat manna in the desert. There, there's YouTube stuff and Google stuff that's going to try to tell you, oh, that's nothing new. Uh, according to the biblical text, this was something brand new to the people. They didn't know what it was. So, what did it taste like? I like this because, you know, I want to know. And you know what the Bible does? It gives me an exact answer here. Well, pretty exact. House of Israel named it manna. And it was like coriander seed, which you can look that up on the internet, get pictures of that all the time. So it's white. And it was, taste was like wafers with honey. Is that pretty cool? So I, I never had wafers with honey. I'm guessing, you know, you take some wheat and then you make some wafers out of it with honey and it's going to taste kind of sweet and, and good. Now, nowadays we have so much down at the donut shop, we wouldn't be impressed with it. But back then, I think they'd been a little more impressed with it. And so there you, you have that. So now we have some very simple rules and regulations. This is uh, what we read a moment ago. But again, it's supposed to go out. They're going to gather it. And he does this that, that he could test them. And again, this is so simple, you cannot mess this up. So I mentioned now and then, and I usually say it with a little snark, I get that, but we adults are not near as tough and mature and responsible and capable as we like to think we are. And that is nothing new. It has always been that way. There's nothing new under the sun. So now you have all of these adult people that they can live their own life. I don't need anybody how to tell me to live my life. I've done the next number of years back there in Egypt under all the Pharaoh's junk. I am a grown man. I have got me a woman. I have got 14 kids or whatever. You know how we do it. Well, I am grown up. These were grown ups. And he says, okay, I'm going to test you. Go out and get what you need for today. Now, on Friday, I want you to get twice as much. Can you do that? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Right. But I may test them. 
And Moses said, let no man leave any until morning, but they did not listen to Moses. Always smarter than their leadership, aren't they? Some left part of it till morning and it bred worms and became foul and Moses was angry with them. Now, I don't know how that worked, but you didn't want to leave any of it till the next day. But this isn't the whole thing. Now, they're already messing up. They got just one job to do. And they already messed it up and they're going to mess it up more. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to do what? Get their manna. We got to go out and get our manna today. And they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? Isn't that, does, does it, that boggle your mind? Are, this is like, no. I can be that illogical too. And you can too. The trick is to see it. Now, when it's up here on the slide, and I'm looking at them two, 3,000 years ago, that's almost 3,500 years ago, I can see what they did. I can see it like, like it is just the sun rising in the morning, right? When it's here, all of a sudden I go blind. I can't see it. Now, here's the funny part. You can see it. I just can't see it. But let me tell you another secret. When you do it, guess what everybody else can do? They can see it just as much as we can see it. But you look at me, nah, I ain't right. That's right. This, this, is, this is what we are. This is humanity. This is our weakness. This is our flesh. This is our, we all stumble many things, James 3, 2. This, this is what we're trying to deal with. Basically, we're trying to learn to be honest with ourselves. Oh. So God provides in his own way and for his own reasons. Uh, and this is what, what we've got to learn to do. This is what they had to learn to do. They had to learn to trust and obey God. I don't know why I chose that way. He never said. Now, the reason I did manna was, and the reason it tasted like honey wafers was, it, I, I don't know. But I do know that he knows. And I know he knows what he's trying to accomplish and what he's wanting to do. And their whole role, and ours by way of example, is just to trust God and obey him. So he's feeding a million people every day. That's Exodus twelve thirty seven is where we extrapolate that. It, there in Exodus twelve thirty seven it says there were 600,000 men capable for war, not tiny women and children, and then there was a mixed group that went out with them. So you start doing the math, you'll end up around, around a million people a day. Now, I want to ask you something. How many of you would like the same meal over and over and over and over and over and over for 40 years? I like Taco Bell. I can do Taco Bell quite frequently, but I don't think I want it seven days a week for the next 40 years. Actually, I think if I eat Taco Bell every day of the week for the next 40 years, I'm not going to see 40 years. You know, it's not going to happen. Now, why did God do this? God was testing them. He had his own reason. He has his own way. He knows what he's doing. And so he provides the same food to everyone for 40 years and equally to everyone. Isn't that kind of neat? God's not a respecter of person, so everybody gets the same manna. It wasn't like there was this upper class manna and lower class manna. Everybody got the same thing. And you just have to look at that and you've got to ponder because there's depth here. And I'm not telling you I've got it all unpacked, but there's something deeper going on. And we did see that because he did say he was going to test them. So it's more than just the gathering instructions, which they couldn't get that right. You know, I want you to go out on Sunday. That was their first day of the week. Get enough for Sunday. I want you to go out Monday, get enough for Monday. But now Friday, I want you to get enough for Friday and Saturday both. Now, they didn't get that part right. But I think there's more here. And I think it relates back to loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, which is Deuteronomy 6, 5. Now, I always quote it out of Matthew 22, 37, because that's just where I anchored it in. But if you look in your Bible, your footnotes or whatever, that is Deuteronomy 6, 5. That's a good Old Testament teaching there. And so I think part of what he's doing is testing the folks in this regard. Will they really love me with all their heart, with all their soul and all their mind? Will they trust me? Will they completely give themselves over to me? And the answer is no, they won't. It's going to be Numbers 11, starting at verse 4. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again. So we got Israel weeping here. And they said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing to look at. 
except this manna. Wine, wine, wine. God is filling their belly with manna from heaven, and they're like, this is all we got. Now, incidentally, just on the side, you get to see a little bit of what their diet was like back then. The average person, you know, back then could have meat. They could have cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. Now, I'm not allowed garlic because I smell like it, but garlic is good stuff. So you get a little, little insight there. Come on, clicker. There we go. So it, it's, all, it's all training. This, this is all about being a, a spiritual pilgrim. And Israel failed to get that deeper meaning. They wouldn't go there. I don't think they wanted to go there. And I think this is part of our challenge, is God's whole plan for you and I is spiritual training. This is not about our belly. This one's big enough, I can't complain. It is not about our, our longevity. It is not about the car we drive, the house we live in, the recreation we get to pursue. That is not the person, purpose of Christianity and spirituality. And it was not back then either. Back then, it was still love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. That, that was the core of it back then. But they didn't get it. They, I don't know what happened to them. On Hebrews 8, excuse me, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, God said, He humbled you and let you be hungry. Isn't that interesting? God knew what He was doing. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what Israel was supposed to get. There, there was the lesson they were supposed to learn. They were supposed to be humble, and they were supposed to look to God and understand that they live by everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was all training. Now, it's a little hard to see, isn't it? I mean, because, you know, we're all tied up in the flesh. We're like, well, how was that training? I don't have to judge that one. You don't either. What did God say it was? He said, I humbled you. I let you be hungry so that you may know. And that was his objective. And the manner God chose to do that was manna. It's his business. It's his call. I'm not smarter than God. I'm not going to stand here and tell you I understand all the psychology behind of it, but I am going to stand here and tell you I'm not smarter than God. I don't know more than he does. He does know why he's doing it. And he knows what objective he's aiming at when he does it. And our job is to get on board. That was their job to get on board and accept the training. But they didn't like it, did they? So in the wilderness, he, and we're at Deuteronomy 8, 16. In the wilderness, he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you. And that he might test you. Now that's the second time we've had testing mentioned. It's mentioned over there in Exodus 16. And now it's mentioned again. Which is interesting. God does what to us? Test us. Oh, that, hmm. To do good for you in the end. Otherwise you may say in your heart. My power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. Remember Gideon and, and his victory with the 300 men. And you remember the reason God whittled it all the way down to 300 men, which would be impossible to win a war with? If you go back and look at it, it states very clearly, no, you can't have all of those men because you will think you did it yourself. I want you to understand that when you get in, win this battle, I'm the reason, God is the reason you won it. God is trying to set Israel up to do good for them. And if you'll read toward the end of Deuteronomy, we won't touch that right now, but he gives them a whole list of all the blessings he wants to give them. He is trying to do good for them so they don't get puffed up in their heart and think, look what we did. He wants them to have an humble heart and respect, honor, and follow God. So this is all training in humility. Interesting training, isn't it? It's kind of hard to put it together. This is why I say it's all training. Every time you look into a situation, every time you bump up against a situation, every time you sit puzzled, irritated, disgruntled, uh, just every situation, just everything. Okay, what, what's, what's God trying to tell me here? What's the training? It's all training. You need to do that with the joys if you want. But we're not inclined to do that with the joys, you know. When we're happy, we celebrate and we dance and we woohoo and we have a great time. It's only when we're in trouble do we sit around and whine and ponder and meditate. When we win, we celebrate. 
When we lose, we ponder. Uh, the wisdom of God again, perhaps. So it's all training. This was training in humility. God was trying to set them up for success. He was trying to get them in a position where he could give them success. They never really got there. As a nation, no, they never really got there. I um, kind of wonder about us as individuals. Well, will we get there? They just, they want to learn. It's, it's kind of like the coach says to the new kid on the team. Okay, this is day one. I, I want you to throw this ball, you two guys, and I want you all to throw it back to your arms ache. Well, that's no fun. That's repetitive. That's mundane. That's redundant. Are you crazy, coach? I, I want to learn to hit home runs or something. But the coach know what, knows what he's doing, right? And he's training them up step by step by step. But a lot of times the people on the team are smarter than the coach. So the thing, and if they don't agree with the way the coach is training, then the coach is stupid and blah, blah, blah. And before you know it, they're off the team. That's kind of where Israel's at. God knows what he's doing. He knows why he's doing it. He knows the end he has in mind for them. And their one big job is to get on board with the training. Boom, that's it. Incidentally, that's our one big job. It's James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, and 4. I've already alluded to it. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect and complete work that you may be lacking nothing. Right? But I don't like this training. I don't like this manna. I don't like this method. Can I train a different way? Not if you're going to do it God's way. It's his way. It's what we do. Israel never got it. So wafers with honey. Training was not meant to be mean and cruel. That, that sometimes, you know, we don't like the training. All of a sudden, we're really complaining. Like they did. You brought us out here to die in this wilderness, you know, they're whining about. Training is supposed to stretch you. Training is supposed to take you a step or two beyond where you're at. That's what training does. So if you were to start going to Planet Fitness with me, and I would tell you this, and I tell the grandkids this, and they roll their eyes at me, but Archer's going to get it when he gets 13 because he can go to Planet Fitness with me then. I say, I want your first day, I want you to walk out of here going, what? This is exercise? Because all I want to do is familiarize you with the equipment. And I want you to go through some motions that are so light you don't even break a sweat. But you hang with me. <laughs> it's going to be a few weeks down the road, a few months down the road, you're going to move some weights you couldn't move the first day. But it's just going to take you a step at a time, step at a time, and we're going to get you there. And if you hang with me, we're going to get you a long ways down the road. That's, that's what God's training does with us. We, we take our baby steps. We desire the sincere milk of the word. So our baby's on the bottle. And then we start growing and we start growing and we keep developing and we keep stretching. And he takes us further and further. And so that's what training's supposed to do. And stretching, how many of you stretch? You got you to have a stretching routine. And one of the things we say when we stretch is you want to stretch just till it's that almost unpleasant, comfortable pain. You know, what, you know what it is. I mean, you don't want to break anything. Don't go that far. But you want to stretch just enough where it's like, oh, yeah. And it's, it hurts so good. That, that's your sweet spot. That's what it's supposed to do. So God's not anti-pleasure, but not at all anti-pleasure. People, they get so fixated on the flesh, all they could think was we wanted our bellies full, we wanted meat and melons and onions and leeks and garlic, and that's everything we wanted. And God's like, that, that's not going to do you any good, but he's not against them having pleasure. I mean, what greater pleasure do you get than a wife and family? And a good woman is from who? Oh, that's from God, isn't it? Uh, and children are from who? Oh, that's from God too. So definitely not anti-pleasure. But physical pleasure is not the goal here. That's where we get messed up. So you can have some physical pleasure, but it's not the goal. That's not why God, Christ, went to Calvary for you. So God fed his trainees so they could train. So they had enough to train. They had enough to follow God. They had enough to be faithful and do what God wanted done. Now, they may not have had enough to do what they wanted to do and do, get done what they wanted to get done, but they had enough to do to do what God wanted to get done, and that's the whole point. That, that's because we're his creation. So he knew what he was doing. He knew why he was doing it, why he fed them manna. The same, can I say it without being too disrespectful, the same old food, leftovers. Well, they were fresh every day. It wouldn't be leftovers. Day after day after day. 
for 1,400 and no, 1,400 days in a row. Ladies, don't you dare try that with your husband. It would be kind of funny. Now we're having peanut butter and jelly again. Well, we've had that for the last two weeks. I know, but we're going to have it again. Enjoy. God could have set up cafeteria lines, western sizzling buffets all over the land, giving them a, a choice of food that would boggle our mind. He sent them manna. That's what he chose. Why? Because he knew what he was doing, he knew why he was doing it, and he knew what he wanted to accomplish. Now, we can discuss that later, but let's get to the foreshadow for us, and we'll start to bring this to a close. Now we're jumping to John chapter 6, Gospel of John chapter 6. We're dropping down to verse 31. He has fed the 5,000. They have been really impressed with getting bread and salty fish. And so they come back for more. Now he tells them, no, don't work for the food that perishes, but work for the bread that leads to eternal life. I think that's back John 6 and 28. And they're going to argue with him a little bit. Don't you love that? They're going to argue with Jesus' name. Okay. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Now, our, our analogy here is manna. And we're going to jump down a few verses now. Now? Right there. John 6, 48. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, this is a discussion about bread, the manna. Jesus is our manna. Isn't that a pretty cool thought? He is our spiritual bread. And that's what he said there. If you read the whole of John 6, he said, you have to drink my blood and eat my flesh, which incidentally is not a reference to the Lord's Supper, though often it gets used in the Lord's Supper, and I'm not going to quibble about that, but this is really about consuming Christ, taking him in, becoming one with him. There's, there's a deeper message. I get the allusion to the Lord's Supper, and, and it's quite common, but actually Jesus' message is quite different there. So Jesus is not here to delight our bellies. He did not come to give us a program of recreation and entertainment. Now, it's going to be moral entertainment, right? Because we're going to claim to be church. But he didn't come and put all this together and carry his cross to Calvary so that we could have a good dog and pony show, a lot of song and dance entertainment. Let's get the quartets together and some duets together and a couple of solos and so on and so forth and put on a show. And that is a shame because today there are places that got stage lights all across. They got theater screens all around. They set the ambience really well they do and they even do fog machines and what have you i think it's kind of neat now this ain't right but it is kind of neat i've been into some of those really really big they like to call them sanctuaries it is big auditoriums but it's kind of dark now it's real dark but it's got that comfortable it's got that comfortable mood where you could fall asleep and the preacher wouldn't see you no it's got that comfortable mood but on the side they do these like blue lights shining up the side of the walls and the one I have in mind is about a 2,000 seat auditorium. I got to do a funeral there once and it was just kind of neat. And I'm like, wow, this is cool stuff. But that's not what Jesus died for. That's not, he didn't come here to entertain us and turn us into a moral entertainment industry. He came here to be our bread and to teach us humility. He's trying to set us up for success on the other side of the tombstone. We don't like that one, do we? Lord, Lord, if you'll set me up for success right now in my career, my family, my marriage, and all things, that, that, now we can talk. But you mean I've got to be dead to get my reward? See, hey, yes, that, that's what I mean. So he's humbling us, he's training us for eternal blessings, and we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And I would definitely spiritualize that myself, but many people do not, but we won't quibble about that right now. And so day by day, Year by year, every day, we go to our manna and we get the portion we need for today. And then we don't go, well, I read six chapters today and the preacher said you need to read three chapters a day on it as a rule of thumb to read through the Bible in a year. I'm a day ahead. I don't have to read tomorrow. Every day. Every day. And guess what? It's the same book. I've been, and you've been too, if you've been doing it, eating the same manna for 40 years. I have. 
When did you convert? I converted when I was 25. I'm 65 now. Simple math right now. Give me another year and it's going to get complicated. I've been eating the same manna for 40 years. How long have you been eating the same manna? Have you been eating it? Or did you get tired of it? And go, I am tired of that. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Let, let me have, now there's a be, let me have my Facebook. Let me have my YouTube. Let me have my sports, my entertainment. Let me have my recreation. I'm sick to death of trying to get something out of that boring old manna. You know what? We live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Guess what that's a reference back to? Israel and the manna. And Moses said, God's trying to teach you that you live by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We read that a while ago in the Deuteronomy passage. So God knows what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. That's kind of cool, isn't it? He knows why he's doing it, and he knows what he's trying to accomplish in us. Now, we're just going to lump that all into salvation because we, we don't have his exact perspective, but we know it's good. So our place is to get on board with God. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He knows why he's doing it. I'm not here to argue with him, double guess him. Second guess is the right way to say that. I'm here to, okay, Lord, this, this is it. Okay, I'm on. You know what you're doing. And when we get on the other side, I think a lot of us are going to walk around, I like to say it this way, a little humorous, with a big red spot on our forehead. Because for the first like million years, we're going to walk around going, oh man, I didn't see that. Oh, I didn't get that either. Boom, that was in the Bible. I wonder how many times we're going to pop ourselves for it. I know mean, some of you are going, not me, I understand everything in that book. Right, you're going to be read all the way around here. You'll really be popping yourself. To the faithful, who's sweet as honey. Honey wafers, wafers with honey. To the unfaithful, he's boring, he's mundane. Is repetitive, is redundant. It really just depends on where your heart's at, doesn't it? That's what it boils down to. Which is he to you?